Hello, everyone, uh, and welcome to this Learning Planet Festival uh, panel organized by Professors Without Borders. Um, we are an organization that works to improve equitable access to quality education. Uh, our mission is to transform education by bridging, bringing equitable, high quality learning experiences to students and education, educators in their home environments. Uh, my name is Stacey Garo, and I'm the Programs Associate at Professors Without Borders, and I will be co-hosting with Eliza Sims, who is the Programs Manager in the organization. This fireside discussion will delve deeper into topics that include experimental learning spaces, non-traditional and cross-cultural teaching, um, education's role in community transformation, and the significance of intergenerational and lifelong learning. All of these topics are incredibly important to us as Professors Without Borders and our concepts we are bringing into all of our programs. Uh, please feel free to put any questions into the chat and we'll get back to them in the last 15 minutes of our call. Um, so joining us today, we have Tom Basson, a seasoned professor with, a teaching, with teaching experience in the United States, India and Africa, as well as Enoch Kulanga, a distinguished educational develop development practitioner in Uganda, Kenya, Egypt, South Africa, and the United States. Thank you both for joining us today. We're going to kick off our discussion today with a question for Mr. Enoch. I don't know if he has joined yet. Uh, or we can start with Tom. Um, he is, he's been kicked out again by his technology. Okay. We can start with um, Tom's question and then hope that Enoch joins. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so should I go ahead or you would you like to go ahead? Um, okay, I'll, I'll kick off the question. So we have Tom on the call with us. who is currently a professor at Miami University in Ohio, but has an incredibly extensive experience teaching all over the world, including two years at African Leadership University in Rwanda. Um, he's also volunteered with us on a couple of programs in India and in Nigeria. Tom, could you please elaborate on your experiences teaching in so many different environments and capacities? Yeah, yeah. Uh, firstly, hello, everyone. Um, let me also apologize for any technical difficulties. I'm in the highlands of Peru uh, for another 24 or so hours when we've got uh, the rainy season here. So a bit of a delay on my end, I think. Um, I've been teaching abroad really for from the beginning of my career. Uh, I joined the U.S. Peace Corps uh, back in roughly 2011. And I began teaching all around the Kyrgyz Republic. Um, later took on a teaching position with the American University of Central Asia, spent about three and a half years in total out in Kyrgyzstan, um, did eventually go on to uh, Kigali, Rwanda, spent a couple of years out there, and then um, did those uh, great Professors Without Borders uh, gigs over the last summer. And what I've really really found in those uh, different experiences is, a, and of course, a wide variety of students. Um, firstly, mo most of the students that I, I worked with teaching abroad um, were low income, were um, low opportunity, at least um, through most of their lives, and through most of them, through uh, some combination of pluck and luck, had found themselves at top uh, regional universities. Um, that had given them enormous amounts of motivation and ambition and, frankly, excitement uh, to be in the classroom. Also, had given them some fear, uh, some fear of, you know, what happens if I don't succeed here? Uh, my opportunities are, are quite limited if this doesn't work out. Um, I found in the U.S., at the locations I've taught at the U.S., uh, very different student bodies for the most part. Um, student bodies that um, are wonderful, are... Um, very um, open-hearted and very excited to make a difference in this world, um, often very idealistic. And I think typically that's a useful thing for young people or any people to have, um, but maybe also uh, a little bit more ready to take their education for granted, um, a little bit more ready to sit in the classroom and kind of be a little bit slouched and say, hey, teacher, tell me what I need to know. Um, so I've seen a lot of differences there. And I've also seen differences in the way that universities operate based on the um, the available talents and the available skills of that talent. 
Uh, so I found that uh, when teaching abroad, particularly at these American style universities or English speaking universities in developing countries, that the focus tends to be more on experiential learning. So these are professors that have often had careers in business and consulting, uh, and they really emphasize for students, get out there, do the internships. Let's talk about um, how you do these things and getting our hands dirty. Uh, and in the U.S. environments, of course, um, you know, I have a small sample size, so I don't want to overgeneralize. But in my limited experience, I found that the faculty tend to be more theoretically focused, tend to be uh, coming more from that academic environment with uh, PhDs and a whole long list of acronyms uh, and coming at it from a slightly different angle with students that might be a bit less experiential, uh, more theoretical. And um, I think we might get into this a little bit later, but for now, just suffice to say, uh, I appreciate that I've had exposure to both of those pathways, and I think there's value uh, in both of those. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Tom. Yeah. Um... That's uh, the insight there was was uh, something that I could reflect on and just seeing the diverse learning environments and learning and learners themselves um, that Tom was talking about. And we're going to merge that together with uh, what Enoch is also going to share. And that's the question that I'm going to ask now. Um, so Enoch has been, has been, his work has been recognized by the president of the United States, Barack Obama in 2018. He's also the founder of Lead Minds Africa, an organization that is dedicated to disrupting the status quo and empowering young people to thrive in education, work, life, and creating a better um, nation for all, basically. Through education, mentorship, leadership development, and job readiness skills training, they aim to provide and create opportunities that enable young people to lead the way. Um, so with that said, uh, Enoch, can you please explain and expand on your current ventures and give us some insight into Lead Minds Africa and your initiatives. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I will ask again if you can hear me clearly. Yes. Um, sorry, you know, sometimes we can get on the road and uh, now I am up country somewhere uh, looking across some mountains. So signals tend to, to be weak. Yeah. But um, really, um, I will begin by by just sharing a, sharing a story, um, and I like to to share it in many uh, platforms or spaces that I'm in. Um, I was born in a, on a small uh, subsistence farm at a time when access to education was was really limited. But then I was lucky to be one of those that got into school and had received um, quality education and went on to really even get a job in Rwanda, come back to Uganda, um, had an amazing experience in Rwanda working at a high school, leading a leadership curriculum. And at that point, I started to have insight, to gain really deeper insight into questions that young people are asking themselves between the ages of 18 to 25. Uh, and mostly by the time they graduate high school, they have some sort of a clear idea of the kind of career path that they want to take. But they are thinking also along the lines, is this really the right decision? Is this really the right field that I need to focus on, that I need to commit to for the next three years in college for the next seven years, for instance, those that go into the medical field. So looking at the opportunity that I had, uh, accessing mentors and going to uh, a, a school that also delivered a leadership curriculum alongside the normal classes, I realized that there was really need to create a platform that brings together people uh, from across across different disciplines, borders, and, you know, uh, fields to really be like jointly share an aspiration of contributing to change, supporting young people to really um, take on, believe in their, in their ideas, believe in their dreams, 
believe in their really aspirations or missions that they can take on in life. So that is how we started off uh, in 2018. And we started with the annual leadership summit, bringing together 150 student leaders, um, young people that already have uh, leadership positions. So the reason as to why we started off with young people that were already in places of leadership is because they, they, they have reached a certain level of bringing themselves forward. They feel they already have something to offer um, to the world, to the community, but it really starting from a, like an institution, a smaller institution that uh, for lack of a better word, like a school, a school where they are, they feel they, they already have the desire to offer something that is different from or what they are already experiencing. They already have clarity that there is something missing and they have an idea of how they can offer something that is different. So we brought in 2018, July 2018, we started off with a, an annual leadership summit um, that bringing together 150 student leaders. Then we engaged them uh, at the end of the summit in a community project. So we are teaching them how to translate the theoretical skills the knowledge that they have learned from these influential individuals that we have brought to them for three days, how to translate it into real life, into contributing to change in, uh, in their communities. And then we went on to start the Leaders Forum that focuses on young people in colleges, those transitioning into the job market, and those that have already uh, found the courage on the boldness within themselves to start different initiatives that are impacting their countries, their communities. So we bring them together, connect them to really people who have already walked a journey ahead, um, built businesses, built uh, organizations, and have been successful, or they are leading the same institutions at a higher level, and they have uh, expertise or a certain unique skill set to offer to the young people who are themselves in um, finding ways that they can offer themselves uh, to contributing to change. Then we, we also uh, run a Minds to Lead program that focuses on bringing on board uh, high schools across Uganda uh, into a leadership curriculum, still work, working with young people to teach them how to turn their passions into purpose, their visions into action. But most importantly, looking them, at themselves as agents of change. Instead of looking at the government, instead of saying, you know, this leader we voted in power in a place of leadership is the one supposed to come back and contribute to the change that we want to see in their community. We are changing the narrative for them and saying, you know, you are the ones we have been waiting for. You are the ones that need to, to step up boldly and really set your communities on a different trajectory. So um, that, is a, that is a program where we work with uh, these young people in high schools. Uh, this year, we are starting a fellowship program, bringing on board 35 emerging leaders who are leading at a higher level, who are really leading uh, social uh, um, initiatives that are contributing to impact, connecting them with, uh, with mentors, like some of you who are on this call, um, <laughs> and, and really supporting uh, young people uh, to contribute supporting individuals to contribute to change. I have seen how tremendously being in networks, being part of uh, some forums around the world, how it, it inspires me, how it em empowers me to believe in the vision, uh, in the idea that we actually have the power to, co to do something that at least even it, if, if it is sing a single action, how it can move the needle in transforming um, our our continent, our countries. So, I think I think that is an idea of how we are doing uh, work at Lead Minds Africa. Um, I strongly believe that beyond education, uh, 
there are certain other things we need to do to support uh, the transformation collectively um, as a people that, f that care about the, the different futures that we want to realize on the African continent and around the world. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Enoch. Um, that was very insightful. Uh, I was really learning a lot about how you inspire youth action in everything that you do. And it's so inspiring to see and just seeing the different programs that you've put in place to make this happen is something that, you know, as a, an aspiring social entrepreneur is something that I really uh, admire. Um, I'd like to just uh, pass it on to Tom and ask, uh, given what Enoch has said, how do you think we can meet in the middle uh, between the theoretical side and the experiential side of learning so that we can all merge together? Because it's something that we described as a 21st century type of education that we're trying to achieve. Yeah, yeah, I think it's an important question. Um, one of the things I've so appreciated about living in so many parts of the world is seeing the commonalities that we do have. It's a bit of a cliche, but it's one that I sort of had to discover personally to see it's a cliche for a reason. There's a lot of truth to it. Um, but we also have a lot of differences. We have a lot of cultural differences and different ways of thinking about the world, different ways of taking action. Um, and I think that the theoretical piece and the experiential piece each offer something to that equation. Uh, the experiential piece is so essential for students to go out there and get their confidence, get empowered, um, really overcome their fears and their limitations. And by the way, meet people like Enoch that are out in the world doing this work um, that are sources of inspiration. I think if you're an 18 year old student sitting in a classroom and you're dreaming and you think you're all by yourself, you're not going to end up doing as much as if you see that there's this person out there that's followed a path similar to where you see huge changes in the world. Um, that experiential piece is essential to that. And I think that there are some parts of the world that are doing a better job of forcing that issue than we're seeing it at least some places in the United States. What I think that the theoretical side of the equation offers and is sometimes overlooked in those experiential environments is that we do have a lot in common. There are universal human norms and there are predictable ways in which humans tend to differ. Now, if I try to predict how me and Enoch differ, we've, we've only talked a little bit, I'd probably be dead wrong, right? I'd get a lot, I'd get a lot missing. Um, or have a lot missing. But if we talk about how our countries differ, we, we, we're probably in the ballpark. We're probably going to have some ideas that are pretty, pretty spot on about the ways in which our cultures might differ. And we can use that information, these universal norms and these more subjective norms to understand what is it about me that is distinct? What is it about me that is shared with all other humans? What is it about me that's shared with the people from my country. And I think if we just zoom in a little bit, right, I'm, I'm a business professor, if we zoom in a little bit on what research can add to that equation is the experiential can take me out into the world and say, okay, it seems like people are maybe more motivated by idealism and purpose and influence and seeing a difference being made, then they're even may, maybe influenced by a little bonus at the end of the, the quarter. And we can go to the research and we can say, well, is that is that weird? Was that just you? Was that just your immediate team? Or is there something in the uni universal norm that says, yeah, there's something in people that really turns on when we see that we're connected to our purpose? And I think unless we can get to the root of that question, is this a one-off or is this a universal then we're not able to take our experiences and apply them in new contexts as effectively. And we're not as able to take our experiences and teach others because it's very dangerous to teach someone. So theoretical without experiential doesn't get us very far, but experiential without theoretical um, 
is a bit of a narrow view. But when we can combine those two perspectives, I think we're we're in as good of a position as as I know how to imagine. Thank you. Thank that you. that final sentence, I think, was you hit the nail on the head on that. I think that that makes complete <laughs> sense. Um, right. That was great. Um, Enoch, feel free to add on to that. Um, but also, I was going to bring up that your um, your career is brought over the world, but your organization seems to really focus on the importance of communities. So what is the importance of transforming communities, especially in the sphere of educational transformation? Oh, um, <laughs> I feel like uh, we can't achieve educational transformation without community transformation. Uh, from way, way back, education in Africa was understood. I want to still believe it is still understood as a collective action, like it is a collective responsibility. So if we are really focused on transforming our education, we need to actually look at community transformation as the most important segment in the whole process because our communities are laboratories. We, how, how, how are we supposed to uh, transform the education if we don't start with actually integrating what is existing in our communities in the whole education curriculum? I feel like, I feel like there is a certain mismatch between um, the education in Africa and how it makes young people focus on the communities where they come from. I feel like they, it orients them to think it is not wrong, but they think they, 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 it, foc it makes them think in a, like a bigger picture. This is what I mean. The education orients young people in Africa to look at like national issues, national issues, continental issues, world issues. I feel like we really need to deeply connect students or young people in schools with the issues that are happening around them, the immediate, the immediate surrounding. So if we are to achieve education transformation, let's focus at communities, let's focus on communities as laboratories in that whole process. That is, that is how there is a whole debate about you know a mismatch between um the 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 skills that the education is offering and the job skills i feel like there is also a huge debate that needs to occur at a level of the mismatch between how the education orients young people to focus on you know the country the continent and ignoring where these 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 communities that are, are actually in need you know so that is that is where we need to start from. I am a strong believer that we cannot achieve education transformation if it does not start at the grassroots. If we don't orient young people to deeply know and care about their communities, um, we are also we are also looking at education transformation at a time when. Our communities are deeply stuffed. Um, you know, they, they, they really fail to achieve durable impact um, because they don't have highly competent, effective, authentic, and socially conscious values-based leaders. How, how we, we are looking at educational transformation, engaging, engaging the leaders in top offices, you know, in government. But I feel like, again, these same leaders in these uh, well aerated, you know, <laughs> offices are disconnected with actually what is happening at a community level. So we need to, we need, I feel like the whole segment where we need to start from is community transformation if we are to achieve educational transformation. The whole education system has to be revamped to orient young people to start where they are and identify the needs, identify how 
they can use their dynamism, enthusiasm, their skills to contribute to change in their communities. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Enoch. You know, I really love the way this conversation is progressing from really dissecting and contrasting uh, the theory side of learning and the experiential side of learning to really delving deep into both of those and how they are both crucial um, in making sure that the young people actually can uh, bring about the impact that we want them to bring about. So I hope, Tom, um, even as we move on to the next question, if you'd like to comment on what uh, Enoch has said before uh, you answer my question, that would also be great. Um, but the importance of community development is so is really highlighted in what you were saying. And you know what, I really agree because it's it's so true. I mean, even me in my uh, education, you're always looking at the bigger things, the world problems, and never what's going on in your actual community. Um, we'd like to move on to Tom and uh, just look at uh, how he's an exemplary professor without, he exemplifies the professors without borders mission, which is to improve quality uh, education through international incentives. So we'd like to, I'd like to find out from Tom, what you think the importance of cross-cultural education is uh, in our societies? Yeah, yeah. Um, so let me just firstly build briefly on Enix Point um, yeah. or, or really just agree with it in a new way, which is to say, if we think about that experiential component, I think that is yeah. the ideal model for how we can get young people involved at the community level. We're not likely to have a 20 year old student going out and dealing with the global issues, but absolutely they can and should be working at the local level. And all the things they're learning about themselves, they're learning about their ability to make a difference, but they're also learning from their community. They're learning from their elders. It's, it's really, a, I think, a very important lesson. Um, and I think it's something that everyone should be so fortunate to have that opportunity to work in their immediate community um, and maybe be inspired by other topics that then take them uh, above and beyond, or perhaps do not. Perhaps they stay in that area for their whole lives. Uh, as far as the cross cultural component, I, I think there's two important pieces that come to me. Um, the first is that I, I think every teacher here knows teaching is reciprocal, right? You can't teach without learning. Um, and I think that's especially true in the cross-cultural domain. Uh, I find teaching abroad, especially in very distinct cultures, such as Nigeria, India, Rwanda, Kyrgyzstan, to be a very humbling experience, right? I go in thinking I know some things, and I very quickly realize how much I do not know. Uh, and I'm immensely grateful for that. I'm sometimes sorry to my students for how long it takes me to catch up. Um, but I'm especially grateful for it now that I'm back teaching in the U.S. environment, because I found to my immense surprise that I understand my mostly American students much better because I'm better able to contrast their cultural perspectives with those that I've seen in other parts of the world. And it's been a real gift in, in allowing me to connect with my American students significantly better at this stage of my career than I was able to at the beginning of my career before I'd done all of that, that teaching that I would go on to do in other parts of the world. So that's one piece. It's just for the teacher, all that uh, cross-cultural environments offer us. Secondly, maybe more importantly, um, is this element of cooperation. I, I think that um, one of the challenges of being a living human is cooperation. And I think we're dealing with it every moment of every day from the micro to the macro. At the micro, we're saying, can I get along with my spouse? Can I get along with my parents? Can I get along with my brothers and sisters? Sometimes yes, sometimes no, right? Can I get along with my neighbors? Can I get along with my wider community? Can I get along with my countrymen, right? We're seeing this in the United States right now with this very divisive political season underway. Every four years we see it and it never really goes away. Um, but we have to keep expanding out to the cross-cultural and cross-national level. We have major global crises that are underway, and they cannot be resolved by individual nations or individual entities. They can only be resolved through global cooperation. And so I think a little bit of what we're doing in this cross-cultural sphere is coming together and saying, you know what? we can do this, we can work together, and we can make each other stronger, we can give each other new ideas that we hadn't come across before. And ultimately, I sometimes feel in my own idealistic way, like each of us has a little piece of the puzzle 
the, we've got the whole puzzle. The puzzle is clearly there. We're just all holding different puzzle pieces. And until we actually come together, we're not going to see that we have everything that we need. So I think that cross-cultural collaboration community for our future, it's good for all of us. Amazing. Thank you so much for that. Um, I, I agree completely. And a massive part of my dissertation I'm writing now is about that. So I, I almost want to quote you into my <laughs> paper. That was that was beautifully said. Um, the the next question, um, back back to Enoch. Uh, Lead Minds Africa's goal is to equip young people to unlock their potential and prepare them for complex challenges that they will face in their communities and future careers. Can you explain why you chose to target this age group? Why, why the young people and not, you know, the people with the experience that's already, you know, has the money or maybe a couple of years under their belt? Why, why the, why the young people? Um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's the right, it is the right time. It's the right time to focus on the young people. We, I like, I like really what uh, my friend uh, Freddy Swanika says that Africa has had four generations of leaders. This is the fourth generation. And for them, they are starting out at a level where Africa has gained a certain level of economic stability and um, economic growth and political stability. And now leaders at the higher level are really collaborating in a very interesting way that we have, no, we have never seen before. Young people now, again, if I can go, if I can mention the third thing is young people in Africa are more aware now more than ever that it is their turn to contribute to an Africa they want. They seem to be more aware about the agenda of the, the African Union's agenda 2063 of building a highly inclusive, prosperous and integrated continent. The old, all the political conflicts and the lack of opportunities that we are witnessing across the continent, this new generation of ours seems to be aware that those things exist, but we cannot miss this chance to contribute significantly to the solving of these challenges that we are seeing all around. Uh, fourth, when you look at the maiden age of the African continent being 19.5 gives us a strong signal that actually the right age bracket to engage right now is the young people between the ages of 18 to 35. That is, that is, that is where we, that, that we need to think more around that. Um, just imagine Africa being the youngest continent with a maiden age of 19.5. We have, have, we have young people now are more educated, like they, we have high enrollment numbers in schools. Young people are having really access to education. We, we are seeing them take up the responsibility to build the next innovative ventures that are solving issues of unemployment, um, you know, poverty and, and, and many other things. So I chose to focus, we chose to focus on this age bracket because we feel that if we miss this chance, then Africa is likely to stay the way it is or actually struggle for the next decades without not, notable uh, transformation that we seek to see. I, I am reminded again by the words of uh, Nelson Mandela um, where he, he, he spoke as if he was in the present already. I admire young people uh, who are concerned with the affairs of their community and nation, perhaps because I also became involved 
in a struggle whilst I was still at school. <laughs> All the people that have significantly contributed to change and we emulate them right now, started when they were young. It, it, we have all the examples around the world. So if we are, we, we, are, we are saying, you know, Africa has to change, then who are we to engage? <laughs> not, not impose our thinking on them, but engage them and position them to realize the potential they have and how they can, the how. If we know the why, then the how is easy and it is the most significant. Also, but also, but also we, we in debt, like we, we, Africa has suffered a lot with the debt. When you look at a country like Uganda, it, it loses 20 trillion Ugandan shillings every year. But then the last two years, Uganda has been on, on the radar of the United States as one of the countries that receives the highest, you know, foreign aid. Um, but who can change that narrative? Who can change that? We, when we go back to the young people and tell them, you know, the, the, this is what has been happening to us for so long. And if we are to realize a different path for this continent, then it is you. But we have to start when they are actually still young and they are, their thinking is still so elastic that we can make them to think differently, to see things differently, and have this um, zeal or um, kind of the boldness to confront to confront issues, even when they are afraid. So this is why we focused on the on this age bracket. Thank you, uh, Enoch. Uh, that's so. I, I'm really learning a lot from that. Uh, just understanding that you know when we actually tap into young people. And what they have to offer, there's so much that I, that can actually change, and we have to start now. Um, so thank you for offering that perspective. Um, our conversation is really about intergeneral, intergenerational learning, also and lifelong learning. So as much as young people are the the future, they are the future. Um, we would like to like contrast that and think about how we can also support the the older generation. So I'm going to direct this question, you know. Just to contrast that, um, Tom, Tom, um, in this past summer, you also taught at our teacher training courses in India and in Nigeria, which were focused on people already uh, well into their careers. So can you please explain the importance of also supporting this age group of people as well and treating education as a lifelong experience? Yeah, so I, I begin by, again, sort of reinforcing what Enoch said about uh, the yeah. youth population. I think there's something um, very exciting about uh, the place that young people are in. They're actively grappling with um, their own ideas, their values, the ways in which they want to live in this world. Uh, and I think there's a really important role for educators to come into that space um, and shape those perspectives and maybe just uh, pour some fuel on that fire that's already there. And I think that uh, if we're honest with ourselves, every year that passes, we get a little more certain about our ideas, a little more confident, a little more reinforced in uh, our perspectives. And it becomes a little bit more difficult to change. I know that's difficult. That's true for me, at least. Um, so I think what I learned, uh, I was really grateful to have the opportunity with Professors Without Borders to work with a wide array of faculty over the summer, is um, it's maybe less in the space of forming ideas. It's more in the space of renewing ideas, renewing understandings that have long been there, but have perhaps gone latent. And I especially saw this in Nigeria. Um, one of the universities that we were at was, from my outside perspective, uh, in a sort of chronic crisis. I think that's the best way to describe it, just chronic crisis. Um, economic difficulties, crumbling facilities, uh, faculty on strike, immense student loan lo uh, loads, faculty just 
um, being weighed down by um, overly demanding requirements. And I think in that place, it's very easy to ask yourself, why am I doing this? What is this for? To even be lost to a certain degree. And I think when I started that session, when I started that training material, the focus was sort of on how can we inspire our students as teachers? And I realized very quickly that no, I need to do my best to inspire these teachers. And I don't really think of myself as an inspirational person. It took a lot of hand wringing about how I was to approach this. But what I ultimately did was not inspire them, but help them find their own inspiration, I think. Uh, and we did that by just discussing how many students do you have walking through your doors every single year? And for some of them, it was in the thousands. And how many years have you been teaching? So how many minds have you impacted? So yeah, your conditions are terribly unfair. And I'm really sorry for that. This is how I felt coming from Miami University, this you know very cushy place. I'm very sorry. And I can't change that. I can't change it. I'm sorry I can't change that too. But I'm so grateful to you. And I hope you're so grateful to yourself for the work that you're doing because it is essential. It is absolutely essential for all the reasons that Enoch just said. And that was a big learning lesson for me that... All of us, adults too, we need those reminders. We need those pats on the back. I know when I get a student that sends me an email expressing gratitude, especially if it's a more effusious one, I copy and paste that. I save that email and I put it in a document just so that I know it's there on any day where I start to question, what am I here for? What is this all for? That's what it's for. So that's my perspective. Thank you. Thank you for that question. That was that was amazing. Yes. Thank you so much. Um, we have 13 minutes left, so we're going to utilize this time to do a QA because we've got um a few chat uh, questions in the chat. Um, I'm going to start with the first one. Um, the the names all merged together, so I don't know where it starts then, but I think it's Attiker. Um, the question is, I'll read it out loud for everybody. Uh, I manage a customer education team in the tech industry. We have a long way to go regarding DEI in the, in the industry. What are the most significant barriers to entry in the tech industry for those in learning po poverty? And how can I begin to address them? I don't know which person wants to, to take that, but. <laughs> Enoch, would you like to go first or would you like me to start? Uh, you, you, can, you can go ahead, Tom. Okay, okay. Um, so I, I think it is a difficult question for, for me. Um, I'm not in the tech space. Uh, you might even say I'm the opposite of that. I am a Luddite. Uh, technology tends to confuse and befuddle me. Um, but what, what is coming to mind here is the, the idea that technology um, is um, very much a privilege. I think of uh, Bill Gates telling the story of how he got to where he's at. And he said, you know, um, most of my position, most of my place in this world is due to luck. He happened to be at one of the top high schools in the entire world in terms of their technology availability, right at a time when I believe it was the internet, perhaps it was uh, probably more PCs, were exploding. He said, if not for that time, having this laboratory available to me that almost literally no other school in the world had, where he tinkered for hours and hours and hours and hours with all of this rising technology, he would have missed the boat. By the time he got access to all of that, he would have been behind, right? It was that first mover advantage. So I think this is a big issue that we have of resources in general being inequitably applied. We have five-year-old children in affluent parts of the world that are getting access to things that maybe another child won't get until they're an adult, actually. Um, so I think that this maybe goes to Rachel's question as well, that we have to think about not simply the position that someone is at in terms of their skills and their knowledge, but rather we want to look at their growth trajectory. How fast is this individual growing? Because that's the true indicator of their potential. So I have a fantastically inspirational former student from Rwanda, and he told me, he told me because I asked, what happened? in your first year here, your grades were quite low in your first year. 
in the university and they became perfect by the end. And he said, ah, well, that first year I was learning how to use a computer. I never used a keyboard before. Simple assignments online through Canvas, these learning platforms. I was completely confused and I was spending hours before I could even get to the work. And then, of course, he was behind on the work as well because he hadn't had this, you know, prestigious private school education throughout his life. But if I look at that student, by the time he got to me, he was, uh, let's say, an above average student. A year later, he was an excellent student. And then he went on to a prestigious master's degree. And I have no doubt if I came across him today, I'd say he's blowing everyone away. His growth trajectory was incredibly sharp. But if I looked at him as a junior in college, I would have said, ah, maybe top 20%. And if I looked at him as a freshman, I would have said bottom 20%, right? So growth trajectory, I think, is especially important when we're looking at people coming from um, underprivileged, underprivileged background. Hmm. Very good. I don't think I, I have something more to add. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you, Tom. I'll ask a question. Oh, go ahead. Um, it's from Rebecca. Um, it says, Prof. Thomas, with your experience in different education sectors in the world on different continents, do you agree that there's a huge gap in terms of quality education given in different places? And if so, how does one play catch up today actually catch up? What is your recommendation? It's a difficult question. Uh, um, again, I try not to generalize, but I, I think I, I am human and I create narratives like everybody else. And in my limited experience is, yes, there, there is a big difference in quality of education um, for, for no other reason, because the more remote locations we go, um, the more brain drain they've had. Right. When we go to very poor places and when we go to, to smaller places, those those people that would normally be the professors, the the thinkers, the doers, they've they've maybe gone to the capital city. They may be gone to a capital city in some other part of the world. Um, they may not be around anymore. So I think part of this is mobility. I, I have right. traveled the world. It is an immense privilege. It is incredibly frustrating to me how difficult it is uh, for many people in the world to get visas, uh, for me to just casually come to Peru, where I am, by the way, advancing my learning. Um, I don't have a hand in that. So I don't, frankly, um, I don't worry about it too much because I, I don't think it's a good use of my my uh, energies. I've got other places to worry that maybe I can do something. But I think focusing, uh, if anyone out there has a role in policy, focusing on that that uh, mobility element and how we can get people to go to the places they need to be is really essential. I think that's one piece. Mm -hmm. um, the second piece that I would say I was hugely inspired by what was happening at the African Leadership University. I don't want to go into too specific of details because I don't want them to come knocking and saying I misrepresented what's happening there. Um, it's been a couple of years since I've been there and they're in the midst of rapid change. Um, but what Fred Swanaker did, the founder of ALU, is he said, you know, we're not bound by the US educational system. And we shouldn't be because we don't have the same resources. And we also have some opportunities that maybe are not available in the US. And I know, for instance, on the African continent, there is a dire shortage of scholars, of doctoral level educators. There's simply not enough to go around. So we talked about experiential education earlier. ALU is really going hard with experiential learning due to a shortage of teachers. They're saying, well, if we don't have enough teachers, then let's make our students the teachers and let's design an entirely new educational model in which we try to figure out how can we get these 18 to 22 year olds to hold one another accountable with a faculty member overseeing much larger number of students. And I think it's, it's, it's difficult, but I think it's being done. Again, I'm not gonna go into the details, but I think it's being done in some of the most creative ways I've ever seen. And I think it's so important that ALU be given a chance to get this right because they will inspire other universities in similar positions to break away from a U.S. model that's not applicable. And by the way, they will also one day be knocking on the door of U.S. universities 
because as U.S. universities, you'll see, oh, look, they're doing some things better than us. And now we can adapt based on what they had the courage to do. But maybe us with our endowments and our you know, regular student enrollment, we're not really ready to take those risks. Uh, so I think there, there are immense challenges out there. I think we have to be attuned to that. But I think experimentation and, and ongoing learning at the institutional level is a really essential component to ensure um, everyone has an opportunity. Yeah, um, Ms. Enoch, you know, would you like to also add on to this? Because um, I think it's a really interesting topic and uh, I really like what Thomas is saying. Would you like to elaborate more on, on that? Uh, the gaps in the education system around the world. You, that, that's, that's what you want me to expand on? Yes, yeah. uh, the question, uh, the, the quality of education and the gaps. Um, just in, in in relation to what Tom was saying about how the AOU system is trying to solve that, would you have any thoughts also about a different setting where this is also being applied or any other thoughts uh, regarding this? Oh, it might be frozen. Thanks. The, the Wi-Fi of the hills and in the world, wherever he Hello? is. Us. Oh, there we go. Perfect. Um, someone is someone was there uh, trying to, to call my, my phone and uh, it's making me lose oh. the... I think one, one of the things is uh, one of the gaps that I, I actually feel in the education systems is in the delivery of uh what what young people how what, what young people are learning is delivered to them i i feel like that is a huge huge gap um between for instance the education that is happening at a school that i went to in uganda and maybe an institution like the african leadership university so the, the bringing people to learn together, to reason together, and build build their own learning um, kind of paces or approaches is very significant, and is it is lacking in our education system. So for me, I would focus really on how we deliver. One of the things I believe, actually, one of it is it it might sound strange. <laughs> it might sound strange. I feel like our education system, yes, needs to be upgraded. But I also feel like the major thing with our education system is how it is delivered. Instead of, instead of inviting students to learn, to design the approach of delivery that is student-centered, we have lecturers or teachers that come, you know, and just read, notice read everything to the students and then they're like oh this is the next assignment we meet for the next lesson uh, <laughs> so if if i'm i may go non-traditional when we we are working with young people in schools every module that we deliver the the last component is what they have learned from this module and how they can implement it, beginning with their school, beginning with their communities. Then we work with them on what they can actually, how they can translate the theoretical knowledge into visible projects. So, so delivery for me is a, is a huge gap that I see between the education systems in Africa and other yeah. countries. Uh, and I think, I think societies that are thriving have continuously improved how they are delivering their educational materials to the young people. Okay, great, thank you. Um, we have uh, just a minute left, but I really want to address this last uh, question before we move on. Um, and before I do, Rachel has kindly put the social medias of everybody on the the panel onto the chat. So if you do want to find us or connect with Professor Zell Borders, um, please find the links in the chat. 
But for this one final question, um, at what point education from primary school, secondary school, or tertiary education should students learning be specialized according to their talents and abilities? Many students spend a lot of time on learning things that they'll never use in their jobs. How do we link the education system to the job market? Tom, you want to go first? Uh, please, thank you, Nick. Yeah, I'll jump in there. Um, two, two brief points, I know we're short on time. Uh, first point is just to note that um, interest often comes only after we get through the hard part of not knowing how to do things, of grinding our way through, and actually of finding it quite unpleasant. Not until we get good at something do we often find it interesting. So I think we want to be hesitant to say to a 12-year-old or even an 18-year-old, um, hey, let's figure out what you love and only focus on that. Rather, this is a time to do the things you don't love and see if you start to like it a little bit later. Um, the second point that I think maybe is even more important is um, where is this world going? I don't know. It is changing rapidly, right? It's been changing rapidly right. and it seems to only be accelerating. I have no idea what my students are going to be doing in 30 or 40 years. Um, I don't really know what they're going to be doing in 10 years in, in the event of major disruptions. So I'm much less interested. In fact, I, I'm somewhat averse to very specialized learning uh, because we might end up really harming those students when those careers, those jobs are just poof, totally gone. I'm much more interested in giving our students the hard training of how to think, how to learn, how to get to the root of answers. And if they can do that in a general sense, they can apply that absolutely anywhere, no matter what the world does around them. Um, thank you, Tom. That is, that is brilliant. There is a recent TED talk um, by I don't know if if I will mention if I will mention it uh, the name rightly, but um, it's Takaharu Tezuka. Um, the TED talk is the best kindergarten you have ever seen. They designed a kindergarten school that allows kids to play. They come into this environment. The environment is designed to allow kids to play. What the teachers do is to watch the patterns of play for the kids. And the patterns of play inform what these kids are curious about. So by the time these kids, I mean, the more the, a kid continues to repeat a certain pattern of play, then it informs how these teachers actually support this kid in identifying what they truly care about in designing lessons that support this kid to identify clearly what they are capable or what they, they, what their gifts, their talents are at a very, very young age. So it is a very interesting case study that I would like to recommend on this panel today. Um, one of the, one of the things is when you look at the, when you look at research, by the time a kid is five years old, they are brain has completed has completed a full circle so it means their cognitive abilities have fully developed and they can comprehend things um you know i don't want to go into the science of neuroplasticity and all that but i feel like if we are to orient young people then we need i am a strong believer at starting very early when we not, not to really impose who we are into them, but orient them in a direction that they can, they can go into the direction of their curiosity, into the things that they actually care about. That is for me, I'm a strong advocate for that. <laughs> um, 
with with orienting the like positioning the education system for the job market i feel it ties already into what we are talking about here there is a repeated pattern uh, pattern in our discussion um young people have a unique way of knowing the things they want to pursue but we actually impose our thinking and it i, I want to submit that it confuses them to pursue things that are not entirely who they are, but because they think, you know, it will make me successful. And, uh, you know, we miss out on the most innovative um, entrepreneurs, on the most innovative leaders uh, of our society, of our generation. So I think uh, the best way to design our education system is to really focus on the things, the curiosity, um, of the young people. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. That was a fantastic answer. Um, and thank you both so much for your time and your thoughts and, you know, giving us your insight. I am incredibly grateful. Um, it's been an, a great conversation. Um, and thank you to everybody who, who joined and asked questions. Um, and I hope you guys enjoyed it as much as, as much as I did. I'm sure you did. Um, if you have any, as I said, if you had any more questions or inquiries about Professors All Borders, please check out our LinkedIn, our website, our social media. We've also put in um, an email address to reach out to us. Um, you can catch up with our with our upcoming events and programs because we're we're staying busy. We're always doing something. Um, and we also have Tom and Enoch's um, socials uh, in the chat as well as they're just as busy. Um, and Stacy, would you like to add anything? Uh, no, um, this has been such an amazing discussion. Um, I love the way that it progressed from the broader sense um, of uh, the, the, the things we were talking about and how we narrowed down to really get into education and um, how young people can really make the most of the things that they're learning and how we can uh, also make an impact in our communities. So thank you both for joining and for answering these questions that we had thank you very much for inviting us i hope um i hope our submissions were were you know impactful or useful yes um for me they yes. were thank you yeah. Stacey. thank you Isaac. thank you everyone for your time Sorry enough, thank, you. thank you all for being here much appreciated definitely Great. Thank you so um, much. Okay. I believe that's the end of our session. Yes.